praise him again. God is good. And all the time. Yes, God is good all the time. All the time he's good. Everything he does is good because he is good. That is his nature. So um, I want to take this opportunity to invite you once again. I know you have been invited severally for this service. And um, it's because we just want you to feel at the feet of Jesus. For maybe those of you who don't know me, my name is Carol Musisi. I am the pastor in charge of Sunday school, and I feel very blessed to be able to just come before you and pour out what it is that the Lord has placed in my heart for you today. Amen? Yes, so let's just pray again. You know, the Bible tells us we should pray continually. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you because of your word and because of the power that's in your word. And in your word, you tell us that we should pray continually. And so, Lord, we know that we can never go wrong when we keep coming to you in prayer time and time again. I know that, Lord, we have been praying since the service began. And, Father, we are still praying. Thank you because you never get tired of hearing from us when we pray. Father, I want to pray for this message. Lord, I pray that you would give me divine utterance and that, Father, you would minister to your children in a very personal way. It's in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Yes, so, um, our topic for today, our, to our topic for today is titled, Behold the Lamb of God. And I think um, maybe we all know that the Lamb of God is um, Jesus Christ. So this year, 2023, the theme of the church is focused on Jesus. And it's based on Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, which says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so we felt, as the leadership of the church, that this year, we, we felt the Lord telling us that we should focus on Jesus Christ. And we have come into a new month, which is April, and in focusing on Jesus this month, we just want to focus on the cross. And today, we just want to look at this title, Behold the Lamb of God. And as we know, the Lamb of God is Jesus Christ. And the highest point of him being called the Lamb of God is his death on the cross. So that is how it just ties in with our theme for this month. So in our scripture reading for today, the time in the Bible was when Jesus walked on earth. So it was during the time of the New Testament. And John the Baptist, who spoke these words, was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He came to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. So who is this John the Baptist? If we may just understand him well, and then maybe we will be able to um, just um, read between the lines of this statement that he made. John the Baptist was a great evangelist. He preached repentance warning people that the kingdom of God was nigh and that they needed to repent of their sins. That one, he was doing evangelistic work. But even what shows us that he was a great evangelist is because he had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. So now I'm talking about the period or that time when he said this statement, behold the Lamb of God. He had had a personal 
encounter with Jesus Christ because he had baptized Jesus Christ. So he had had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And when he said these words, behold, the Lamb of God, he was pointing his own disciples to this Jesus that he had had an encounter with. And he shared his own experience with Jesus to them. That one we have seen it in our scripture for today. He actually shared his experience with Jesus Christ. And so he encouraged them to have an experience with Jesus Christ. That was very, very evangelistic. The heart of evangelism is taking note of what God is doing in our lives. Or let me make it more personal, taking note of what God is doing in your, in, in your life and then sharing it with others and then inviting them to come and get their own personal experience with him, that is Jesus Christ or God. So after you have encountered God, you need to tell it to others and then encourage them to just um, experience God for themselves, not to um, don't encourage them to depend on you like you are the, you're, you're the only one who can, you know, get a word from the Lord who has a personal um, touch um, with the Lord or who can, um, who, who, who is the only one who can contact God. We are supposed to, like John, John the Baptist, um, encourage the people that we are telling about God to also get their own personal experience with him. So John refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God in his evangelism to the disciples. So that was um, John the Baptist. So let us now look at the spiritual atmosphere in Israel at that time. The Jews were eagerly awaiting the Messiah. But unfortunately, they had no discernment. And part of the effects of having no um, discernment is that, or, or the, the, the discernment, what causes um, um, one not to have discernment is the coldness in the heart. They had no discernment because we all know that Israelites, the, 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 the Jews did not even recognize this Messiah that they had been awaiting all these years. It's because their hearts had grown cold. They were not sensitive to the Holy Spirit. No wonder they crucified Jesus soon after this. They crucified Jesus a few years down the line and they labeled him a criminal. So when we look at the very atmosphere, the, the, the spiritual atmosphere was cold. The Holy Spirit was not alive in many of their hearts. And now we see John the Baptist trying to point people to Jesus Christ. Because he knew, even as he was preaching um, repentance, he knew that these people, many of them, most of them, their hearts had been, their hearts had been hardened. And he was just trying to preach to them in order to soften their hearts that they would be able to recognize their Messiah. So that is what was happening in, 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 the, in the atmosphere. So let us look at the Lamb of God, uh, the Lamb in the Old Testament Bible times, because John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. So let us just look at a Lamb and let's look at it from the Old Testament. Testament Bible times. So, to be called a Lamb of God, as John the Baptist called Jesus, meant that God would give Jesus to be killed like a lamb for the sins of mankind, so that mankind can get an opportunity to be reconciled to God. In the Old Testament, majority of the passages that mention a lamb are in reference to a sacrifice. Majority of the scriptures in the Old Testament where a lamb is mentioned, it's in reference to a sacrifice. So generally, 
a lamb was a sacrifice. So we can just try to picture in our minds if John the Baptist is saying, behold the lamb of God. It means it's a sacrifice. And we know, we know what, we know what a sacrifice is. Even just generally what a sacrifice is. A sacrifice, when, when you make a sacrifice, it's something that takes you out of your comfort zone. It's something that you go out of, out of your way. So we all know about the Passover lamb. The blood of the lamb was put on the doorposts of the Israelites' houses in order for them to escape the wrath of God. When the angel of death was coming round and the angel of death had been sent to come and smite the firstborn of the Israelites, of, of the Egyptians, sorry. And so the Israelites had been told to apply the blood of the Passover lamb on their doorpost so that when the angel of death would come, the angel of death would pass over their house. So a lamb was very, very significant when it came to the liberation of the Jews when they were being rescued from the hands of the Egyptians. We see that a lamb was very significant. And we are talking about not just a lamb, but a slaughtered lamb. And so we are talking about its blood. It was the blood of this lamb that was used in the liberation of the Israelites when they were being liberated from captivity in Egypt. So the angel of death took the lives of every Egyptian firstborn, but passed over the households that had the blood of this lamb on the doorposts. To this day, the Jews all over the world celebrate the Passover. The priests in the temple in Jerusalem sacrificed a lamb in the morning and in the evening daily. We just want to really get more insight into what a lamb is. And this we see in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 29 and verse 38 to 39, it says, this is what you are to offer on the altar regularly each day. Two lambs a year, two lambs a year old. Offer one in the morning and the other at twilight. So for hundreds of years, Jews brought lambs to the temple as sacrifices for their sins. For hundreds of years, they kept coming back year after year because no lamb was fit enough to completely sort out this problem and just blot out their sins once and for all. And so they would keep coming with lambs every other year. For hundreds of years, they would keep coming with a lamb, a lamb, a lamb. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice that John proclaimed in John chapter 1 and verse 29 when he said, Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Like Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. That is what this statement really means. He was the ultimate sacrifice. Prophet Isaiah foretold the Messiah's sacrifice. And this is seen in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7. And it says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And so, when John the Baptist calls Jesus a lamb and says, Behold the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, Jesus is actually just like the lambs that were slaughtered in the Old Testament. He was given as a sacrifice. And in actual sense, all the lambs offered in the Old Testament, they all point at Jesus. All the lambs that were slaughtered in the Old Testament, they are all just pointing at Jesus Christ. You know, the Old Testament was all about preparing for the Messiah, the Messiah who was to come, the Messiah who was to redeem us, the Messiah who was to save mankind from sin. Old Testament all revolves around Jesus. Now the highest point of the Lamb of God was the sacrificial death on the cross. 
because we have seen that um, the, the lamb was all about sacrifice, being slaughtered, the blood, that, that blood just kind of um, cleansing, the blood just cleansing, the, 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 the blood of, of, of the lamb being used to cleanse and not just cleansing anything, but cleansing sin. And therefore, when John the Baptist calls Jesus the Lamb of God, and he tells his disciples, behold, here is the Lamb of God, it means that he is a sacrifice. And so the, the highest point is that, that point where he's actually sacrificed and his blood brings um, liberation, his, his blood brings salvation. And now this brings us to the theme of our month. This month, the theme is focusing on the cross. So the, the cross was the highest point of the lamb. And the cross is the meeting point between us sinners and Jesus Christ. The cross is very, very, very significant in our Christian faith. It is a very important component. It's a very important aspect of our Christian faith. That is the center of our faith. No matter how sinful we are, the cross gives us access to Jesus Christ and his saving grace. It was at the cross that the sinful thief met Jesus at the time of crucifixion and his sins were forgiven. We know that story. The sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is the main message of the Bible. That sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. In fact, the, the, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, as John the Baptist called him, the Lamb of God, is actually the main point in life. It's just that sometimes we don't realize it. But that is the main point. We know that in the beginning, at the time of the fall of man, when Adam and Eve were being sent away from the Garden of Eden, God promised them that he would send a redeemer. So in, in God's perfect plan, we were just supposed to live in heaven with him forever. But we know that Lucifer, who was one of the angels of God, very beautiful angel, very intelligent, very favored, he just became greedy, he became selfish, and he sinned. He's the one who brought sin into the world. And that is how we find ourselves in a fallen world. But even in this for, fallen world, it is not, we, we are not here forever. Doesn't matter how old you grow, everyone must exit from this world. But we know that we have a soul that lives forever. So our life doesn't end here. In fact, this life that we are living here is so, 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 so temporary and so, so, so short. The eternal life is actually what matters. But many times we spend a lot of time on the things of this world and we forget the things of eternity. Why Jesus died on the cross. Why God had to give us his lamb. Because Jesus was the lamb of God. It was in order for us to secure our eternity. And we all know that God has given us a free will. God can never um, force you to follow him. But he loves you and the Bible says he has loved us with an everlasting love. To this point of giving his one and only son to die on the cross for our sins. To be the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate lamb. So, as I've said, man fell from sin when he exercised his will against the will of God, the creator. God created man, male and male and female, with the ability to make free choices. God has created you with an ability to make a free choice. 
The choice is yours. Man chose to take a course that was opposite to what God had intended for him. So we can say that the source of sin in human race is the will of man. It is actually the will of man. In fact, when you sin, you have nobody at all to blame. Sin is a choice. Even in Sunday school, we teach the children. They need to know that when they sin, it's a choice. Even if somebody came and influenced them, maybe they followed um, the, the peer pressure or someone talked them into sin. But we still tell them, ultimately, the choice was yours. You chose to uh, be in agreement with whoever it is that led you into sin. So the sin in the human race is the will of man. The sin in your life is your choice. It is you who chooses. And sin leads to death. This we see in Romans chapter 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. Death over here literally means separation. And this is the, the, the worst separation. Separation from God eternally. And this is the worst thing that can ever happen to anyone. None of us should ever find ourselves eternally separated from God. It is the worst thing that can ever happen to anyone. Eternity. But God has given you a chance. When you are living on earth, you have that opportunity to make the right choice. To make the choice to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. And it is that easy. The cross is what conquers sin, death, and totally defeats Satan. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 says, Having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. First Peter also, First Peter chapter 2 verse 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. So that is what the Lamb of God really is about. That is what John the Baptist meant. That actually Jesus' body would be afflicted and through his blood we would get salvation. So Jesus' death on the cross is God's love. He provided this ultimate lamb and this just demonstrates the highest point of God's love. When God called, when, when, when John the Baptist said that Jesus was the lamb of God, it was like the highest point of God's love. Because ever since the fall of man, God has been working on restoring man back to himself. Ever since um, Adam and Eve sinned and they were sent away from the Garden of Eden, God has just been working to restore us back to himself because God loves us. You know, sometimes the enemy can lie to us and we can end up thinking that maybe God is a fault finder. Like he's just there waiting to, to, for us to sin so that he can get maybe an excuse to punish us. But the truth is, God is so loving that if there's any opportunity he's waiting for, it is the opportunity to catch you doing something right so that he can align you to his will and use that against the devil. And God's desire has always been to dwell among his people. And that is why Jesus even came in the form of man. Jesus came to show us what God is like. God was now dwelling among us in body through Jesus Christ. In the Garden of Eden, God walked and talked with Adam every day. This is what friends do. They spend time with each other. And Jesus wants to, and Jesus wants to spend time with us. God wants to spend time with us. God wants to dwell inside of us because he enjoys spending that time with us. 
And even we see it in the Old Testament before the Israelites, before the Israelites worshipped God in a temple, they had a mobile worship center and it was called the tabernacle. We all know about this tabernacle. And this was during the time when the Israelites wandered in the wilderness. God wanted to dwell among them and so he asked them to build a tabernacle for him and they would be moving around with this tab tabernacle in the wilderness and just knowing that God was dwelling among them. So after these Israelites were freed from Pharaoh in Egypt, they were in the wilderness for 40 years before they reached the promised land. And while they were in the wilderness, this is the time that the, this um, tabernacle actually came into being. And the word tabernacle simply means dwell. That is the meaning of tabernacle. To dwell is to stay or to live. So the tabernacle was a very holy and sacred place. This tabernacle pointed to Jesus in every sense. The tabernacle was just pointing to Jesus. And in various aspects of the tabernacle, it is seen that Jesus is light and life. He is the present one. He is the strong one and so on. There is so much in the tabernacle that points to Jesus. So many aspects. I want us to look at just one of the aspects of the tabernacle that actually points to Jesus and that is the righteous one. In this tabernacle, there was a fence and it was all around the courtyard of the tabernacle and it was made of pure white linen. Now, this white linen was a picture of God's righteousness. In Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 7, it says, Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am the Lord your God. So, God is holy and we are sinful and this sin separates us from God. Sin is actually like water and oil. They don't mix. And so let's come back to this pure um, white linen that, that was a fence around the tabernacle. The pure white fence stood between God and sinful man because um, God is holy and in him there is no sin. And if they, they, there is just one thing that can prevent us from going to heaven, and this one thing is sin. Because God and sin, they do, not, they do not mix, they do not meet, and sin cannot be in heaven. And we are man and we are sinful. And so this white linen was just um, like a symbol, like separating God and men. Because Men were sinful and men are still sinful. But there was only one entrance through this pure white fence. The entrance was different. The entrance was actually colorful. It was blue, purple, and red. And so that is how the people of Israel knew that this is the entrance into the tabernacle. However, through this one and only door that God had provided, the children of Israel could not enter without a sacrifice. So even as they were in the wilderness moving around with this tabernacle and they needed to go inside the tabernacle to be in the presence of God, when they got to the entrance of this pure white uh, linen cloth, they had to make a sacrifice. And so this um, was one of the points where they used a lamp. An animal had to die before they could come into God's presence. And this was the picture of the lamb that was going to die in future to cleanse man once and for all from sin and provide a way for man to be reunited with God, for man to be reconciled with God. So even at this point, God was trying to show the Israelites that there is only one way to come to me. And he was actually preparing them for the Lamb of God that was going to be sacrificed at 
some point. And therefore, as Christians, we need to know that the cross is center. The blood of Jesus Christ is center. And sin is real. And God hates sin. It is this sin that will prevent us from going to heaven. And so we should concentrate on eternal matters. It is, it is good to work hard even when we are in this life. Work hard, live a, live a good life. Anyway, even the Bible says he who doesn't work will not eat. So it is good. But it is very important for us to remember the work that Jesus did when he died on the cross for our sins. That is the only way through the cross that we can get to Jesus, that we can be reconciled with God, that we can have an eternity with God. And so just as there was that white linen that surrounded the tabernacle, God is telling us today that Jesus Christ, his son, is the only way to get to heaven. You might be seated over here and you have never really made that conscious decision. I want to follow Christ from today. This is a wonderful opportunity. This is an opportunity for you just to raise your hand, come to the front, give your life to Jesus Christ and secure your eternity. This place where we are, we will not be here forever. But eternity is forever. Everybody, every single one of us will live forever. It's only that we will live in either with God or totally separated from God in that terrible place of fire. We are all going to live eternally. But where is your eternity going to be? And eternity is final. And that is why the Lamb of God was sacrificed on the cross to give you that opportunity. And again, I'll remind you, you have a free will. But I would personally urge you just to make this decision that Jesus will be your Lord and Savior from this day forth. So if you would like to give your life to Jesus Christ, I ask you just to raise your hand, walk to the front. It's the best decision that anyone can ever make. And it's a decision you will never ever regret and we are here. We will walk you through it and help you. So if you are here, I just want to invite you you are here, you have never made that decision. You have never thought of the Lamb of God that seriously. But today you're saying, Jesus, I want you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. You could just come to the front. You could raise your hand. We will help you. You will secure your eternity with God. Okay. I thank God that we are all children of God. And so at this point, I just want to end my sermon. But also I want to tell you, maybe you're seated there and for, for whatever reason, you didn't raise your hand. I'm still here. The other pastors are here. Even the ushers are there. Once this service is over, you can just approach one of us and we will still help you. God loves you and he really, really wants to spend eternity with you. So at this point, I just want to ask us to stand up as I give a closing prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you, Lord, even for reminding us of the significance of the cross and even of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. 
Thank you, Lord, for reminding us that Jesus was just like those lambs that were slaughtered in the Old Testament to purify your children from their sins. But Father, he did it once and for all. And when he died on the cross, we don't need to keep slaughtering lambs. And Father, we want to thank you because you have made it so easy for us. Thank you, Lord. Indeed, you are doing everything in your power just to make sure that we secure our eternity with you. And Father, you have made it so easy. We don't need to look for a lamb to sacrifice. All we need to do is confess that you are our Lord and Savior. All we need to do is invite you into our hearts and just make a prayer. And Lord, our sins are forgiven. Now all we need to do is fall on our knees and cry to you and just ask you to forgive us. And according to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, you forgive us when we ask for forgiveness. Lord, indeed, we can see that you have always been working and you are still working toward restoring us to you. Thank you, Lord, for this reminder. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and was sacrificed as a lamb just to bring us back to you and reconcile us to you. Father, we are praying that you would keep reminding us of this message. We thank you, Lord, and we bless you. For this we pray in the name of the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's say the words of the grace. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you very much and may God bless you.